This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the OnePlus 8 Pro. So it's their first total go for it flagship Android smartphone. So what does that get you? A few features that they used to be missing, like official IP68 water resistance. They used to say that the phone was, but they didn't want to pay for the certification and raise the price, yada yada. So now it is officially IP68 water resistant. You also get wireless charging finally, yay. And not just wireless charging, but the fastest wireless charging we've seen yet on a phone, 30 watt. So Samsung phones do 15, iPhones do 10. That gives you an idea. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more in some of the catches with that wireless charging stuff. We've also got a wonderful 6.78 inch AMOLED display or OLED display and it's 10 bit, it's low blue light, it's super color accurate according to DisplayMate. Nice to look at, a little too curved on the sides for my taste. Now that phones are getting a little flatter again like the Samsung Galaxy S20 family, the accidental edge presses, yeah, on my nerves a little bit, even if it's still a kind of pretty look. The latest Snapdragon 865 CPU, 5G inside gets complicated though. We're going to talk about that now too. So what do I mean is complicated about that 5G thing? Well, it's available on more carriers than ever, which is to say it used to just be T-Mobile and now Verizon will be selling it too. But aha, that's just the OnePlus 8, not the 8. Pro. The 8 Pro is still being sold direct by OnePlus as an unlocked phone. So you can buy it and you can use it on Verizon or you can use it on AT&T or T-Mobile and uh, Sprint now technically is part of T-Mobile. But when it comes to 5G, if you want 5G, which is the millimeter wave, super fast, but not very available, Verizon kind, you got to buy the regular 8 from Verizon. The 8 Pro doesn't support that. Uh, if you buy this phone and use it on T-Mobile, that's the best case scenario. So you get low and mid-band 5G. Mid-band is really what Sprint has, but it's getting subsumed into T-Mobile them, and we've been using it on their low band. 5G and actually it's really doing well. It's a little bit faster and a bit better reception than the McLaren version that OnePlus was selling before. With AT&T, because they won't let any 5G phone on their network unless they have certified it, you don't get any 5G. Now that's up to AT&T and that would only be their low band support there, not the high millimeter wave, but will they in the future support that? I don't know. So best case for the unlocked in the United States is T-Mobile. If you're in a different country and you have different deals and different carriers, of course, it'll be different to you. The phone does support a huge number of LTE 4G bands like we've seen and a reasonable number of 5G bands. You can see on screen what those bands are now. In terms of the looks and the build of the phone and all that sort of thing, you know, OnePlus has not been a slouch since the days they were a $500 to $600 Android smartphone. And that's kind of the sweet spot of where maybe OnePlus is for a lot of you people still. You got almost all the flagshipy stuff. You got a great display. It might not have been the maximum resolution, but you did get the fastest CPU and a beautiful Oxygen OS skin on Android for five or $600. And now we're talking about 900 to $1,000, depending on whether you want it with eight gigs of RAM and 128 gigs of storage, or 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigs of storage. No micro SD card slot to expand that. So yeah, I can't say the build has gotten so much better, say from the OnePlus 7 series, but I love the new finishes, particularly, particularly our glacial green, which is a blue green. You could call it blue, you could call it green, and you wouldn't be wrong in either case, but it's a matte finish or a very frosted finish and it looks nice and doesn't show fingerprints as much. It's still slippery though. There's that. Uh, that one is only available in the 8 gig slash 128 gigs of storage model. If you go up to the more expensive version then you can get an ultramarine blue which is pretty or black, your choice of those. The camera design on the back is pretty clean and it's the, shall we say, old-fashioned strip of cameras and not the big rectangle or quad cameras or whatever you want. But yes, there are four cameras here. Three of them are very good. One of them is pretty pointless. We have a 48 megapixel main camera and a 48 megapixel ultra wide camera, both of those using Sony sensors with pretty fast lenses. And we have a telephoto lens and that one does 3x optical zoom, so lossless, and it looks quite good. We'll talk a little bit more about the cameras later. The fourth camera is a color filter camera and really that was a waste, I'm sorry, one plus of engineering time and money and all that. Uh, you can see on screen what that does. It just adds bizarre color tints 
depending on which one you choose, or there's a vivid, or there's a black and white and stuff. And I don't really think that this is adding anything over the usual software filters that we see everybody put on their phones. In terms of biometrics, we have the usual in-display fingerprint scanner. That's the optical kind. The good news is that's very fast. The bad news is it's not as secure as Samsung's slower kind of ultrasonic fingerprint scanner. And there's Face ID, and it's your regular 2D Face ID. Not super secure. Somebody could fool it with a picture of you, whatever, you know, you know who you are if that really might be an issue for you, but it's very quick. Uh -huh. Speaking of that, no more pop-up selfie camera. Instead, we have a tiny hole punch camera, and I'm okay with that. I mean, when they came up with the clever pop-up cameras, it was to address the fact that most phones had big, ugly notches up top. Hello, iPhone 11 Pro Max. You still do have that, in fact. So now hole punch cameras have also not just gotten smaller, they've gotten even smaller. It's pretty unobtrusive. I'm fine with that over a more complex and somewhat slower way of doing, say, facial recognition, you know, that pop-up camera. I don't have complaints with that. Nicely done. When it comes to the software, we have Android 10 with the usual Oxygen OS, which is a very nice, clean overlay over Android that is fast. It has a couple of useful tweaks and all that sort of thing, so I'm down with that. I think that's one of the selling pluses for OnePlus. Now, there's still one thing that isn't here yet, though. OnePlus says they hear you and they're going to be adding, but we don't know much more than that. And that's always on display. There is an ambient display, at least, so you can tap the phone and it'll wake up and show you notifications, the clock, whatever it is you want. And if you pick it up, it'll wake up, too. So this is an improvement over absolutely doing nothing <laughs> if you pick up or touch the phone, right? So that's that's that. In terms of performance, you know, OnePlus phones always feel fast and fluid, and that 120 hertz display only helps because everything just scrolls along like it's more painted on the screen than anything else. Benchmark's fine, performs great in games, and speaking of that 120 hertz display, unlike Samsung, where you can only use it at the lower Full HD Plus resolution, OnePlus will let you use it even in QHD Plus resolution, which is quite high. It's up to you, and they warn you, you know, that is going to hit your battery life hard, so... Since this is a 120 hertz display, you can do this kind of party trick that probably nobody actually wants. And in fact, you can downvote it if you look at the settings. And that's to kind of upsample video. So you, it's sort of like TVs that do the same. They take 30 frame per second content and they make it 120 frame. So yeah, you get that soap opera effect. It doesn't look so natural. The phone does have a dual SIM carrier, but in the United States, where we're using it with a T-Mobile SIM with an AT&T, it's only activating one SIM. I don't know if that's going to change in the future, so if you're in the United States and you're counting on dual SIM functionality from the 8 Pro unlocked version, it's not here right now. The phone has stereo speakers. OnePlus is always proud of that. It's nice to have. The audio is kind of average, though. I, I, they're not beating the S20 family of phones, for example, in terms of audio quality, or even the iPhone 11, mm, but it's fine. Actually, it's cousin, the Oppo Find X2 Pro that we reviewed, close relative, in fact, made the same parent company. That one had really impressive audio compared to this. Can't have everything. While the speakers might not be anything out of the ordinary, one thing that is is the excellent haptics on this phone. OnePlus has been doing a good job with that, so if you like it to vibrate, you got it here. As ever with OnePlus, you get that nice slider switch on the side so you can switch between vibrate and silence and, well, ringing very easily. Other amenities include Wi-Fi 6, Bluetooth 5, and you've got NFC and you can use that with Google Pay. So that all sounds good and pretty flagshipy, right? So let's talk about the cameras a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> compared to the OnePlus 7 generation of phones where the camera rollout was kind of bumpy, they did software updates that really helped a lot, but the initial rollout was meh. This is really solid stuff, and especially for those of you who like that ultra-wide angle, which is often a second-class citizen compared to the main camera, both of these being 48-megapixel Sony sensor cameras, they both take really good shots. I, I will say one thing, though, that OnePlus does over-sharpen a bit, uh, and it's okay in a lot of situations, but if you're doing a landscape, a lot of leaves, grass, trees, that sort of thing, it can quickly become overwhelming and over-detailed looking. It doesn't look digitally nasty, though. It just kind of looks like somebody photoshopped it as much as they could into detailed perfection. So I leave it up to you as to whether you like that versus a more naturalistic look. And if you thought that Samsung oversaturated photos, OnePlus is there to just amp it up a little bit more. Man, the colors in these pictures. 
Of course, that said, most people, you know, they're not professional photographers. They're just doing this to take really pretty pictures to share. And if they're really crispy and sharp and they're really super colorful, probably a lot of people are going to be happy with this. So overall, I'm pretty impressed with what they've done here. I don't feel like, oh man, I wish I had my S20 Plus or iPhone 11 Pro or anything like that. It's well done overall. You get 4K video recording at up to 60 frames per second. They have the standard 16 by 9 or their Cine, Cine however you say it, S-C-I-N-E, you know, cinematic super widescreen recording option. There is no 8K video recording, unlike the Samsung Galaxy S20 family of phones, but I think right now that's not really the most useful feature anyway. No. There is no HEVC recording right now for those of you who want that more efficient video codec. Um, again, I think a lot of people won't care, except for the fact that you don't have a super lot of storage on either version of this phone and there's no expandable storage. So if you're into recording a lot of video, you probably will be mindful of how quickly you can fill it up. You can use about 500 megs a minute, for example, shooting 4K video at 60 frames per second. The telephoto lens is quite good. It's an 8 megapixel and it's 3x optical zoom. Like I said, we don't have any real fancy hybrid things like the S20 Ultra does from Samsung, but up to 3x, which is optical, it takes nice sharp shots. No disappointment, no complaints about the fact it's only 8 megapixels. I like the results that I'm getting. Uh, if you do want a digital zoom, it will degrade quickly. So you have to be happy with 3x, which is better than average and beats the iPhone that's still at 2x for optical zoom. When it comes to battery and charging, let's get into this. It's always the good and the bad with OnePlus. The good is they've always been pushing the envelope for how fast you can charge your phone. And now they're doing the same thing with wireless charging. And they said that they didn't do wireless charging sooner uh, because wireless charging was pretty slow, right? And now we're up to 15 watts with most Android phones, and that's decent. So they roll it out with 30 watts. So we're talking 50% of a charge in a half an hour on a wireless charger. That is super duper fast. Well, that's cool. And here's the trick, not unlike their wired chargers. If you want to get that speed, you have to buy their $70 wireless charger, which is like a stand. It has a big fan on the back because wireless charging generates a lot of heat. So, yeah, if you put on any other cheap wireless charger you have, say you have a 15 watt Samsung sitting around or whatever, then it's just going to charge at 5 watts, which is pretty slow. So it's proprietary, just like their warp charger. It's the Warp 30T charger, a 30 watt charger, but you got to use their charger if you want to get that maximum charging speed. Not bad. 4510 milliamps. So that's about like the S20 Plus, which is its most direct competitor, I would say, in terms of size and price, though it is a little bigger and bulkier than the S20 Plus, and that's noticeable in hand, let me tell you. But the battery life's not quite as good as the S20 Plus. Both of them running on the same T-Mobile 5G network to keep things fair, because 5G is a little bit more of a power consumer. A uh, battery life is good on this, uh, definitely an all-day phone unless you are playing games all the time or whatever, GPSing your way through life. Uh, it's pretty much an all-day phone or six hours of screen on time at best, five and a half to six hours at best. So pretty good. Not the best we've seen, but pretty solid. It definitely does better than the OnePlus 7T Pro 5G McLaren on T-Mobile, very long name there, which has always been battery life challenge. But that was kind of an interim moving towards 5G phone and not really great optimization for the power consumption. So what about this versus the 8? This obviously is not a smackdown. We will be reviewing the regular OnePlus 8 as well. And with this one, you gain the telephoto camera, which I personally like a lot. It gives more flattering portrait shots when you're taking pictures of people. It's great if you like to take the occasional pet, baby, squirrel, whatever, where getting close distracts them and they stop doing whatever cute thing they're doing. Versus the dedicated low resolution macro camera on the regular 8. I, I just don't see a need for that, especially because there's already macro mode on the 8 Pro and it does a pretty nice job. You are getting a little bigger screen here, but you know, it's not that big a difference. They're not hugely different in size, but I would say the 8 is probably more comfortable for more hands. It's about the size of the S20 Plus, so not as bulky, not as much of a big boy. 
also lighter too. This phone, the 8 Pro, is 199 grams. That's one heavy phone. In favor of the OnePlus 8 Not Pro, if you're in the United States, is that if you are a Verizon or T-Mobile customer, you can get it from your carrier directly and you get more optimized 5G, mostly when it comes to Verizon. With T-Mobile, you're doing okay anyway. And lastly, 90 hertz refresh rate for the 8 versus 120 hertz. And they're both pretty nice. I mean, 120 hertz is a little nicer, but given the fact there's like $200 difference in price, it's not $200 nicer. So that's the OnePlus 8 Pro. It's a very nice phone for their first flagship effort. I'll say that they have gotten all the things that they needed to get done, done here. This is, I don't have any real major dings on this phone other than the iffy 5G compared to some other phones that you're going to see offered by carriers that are going to cover all the bands and all the kinds of 5G that are available in your country. But beyond that, one thing I do wish is that they would still also do their sweet spot. The reason why many of us came to love OnePlus phones is that five to $600 phone that gave you a lot of the things you cared about, really fast performance, a very nice display, a good looking phone, but without having to spend like a thousand dollars, you know? So I hope that they continue that effort too. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.